The following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back. Insight Pitch with Skip Lockwood. I'm Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I have the privilege, the honor, and uh, the fun of talking with my pal, Skip Lockwood, every week. How are you, my friend? I am suffering from a little cold, but I'm doing okay. It's turned chilly back here. I think we're going to get a warm spell coming the next couple of days, like an Indian summer, but it's been chilly, and uh, fall right. is definitely here. I think that uh, yeah, you're blessed with in, four seasons back in Massachusetts. Oh, uh, I'm, we have we have uh, we have winter, and then we have the Fourth of July. Are the two seasons that we have. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, we in California, in Northern California, have the boredom of just having the two seasons of uh, fall and spring. It uh, where I am in um, it, it, there aren't really many summer days as we know know them, but uh, consequently there aren't really many winter days too. And I enjoy not having um, that freezing feeling. So, viva la difference! You were out in in Oakland for a while, were you not? Yeah, I I played. Uh I never was suited up for the home team in Oakland. Um, Milwaukee, of course, went out there a lot. Red Sox right. went out there. Uh, when I played in Anaheim, uh, it was very warm, very hot in Anaheim. I don't think we had much of a, a change out there. I, I didn't like California as much as I thought I would. Uh, we didn't make as many friends out there. Uh, the team that I played for, the, the uh, California the Angels, it, it was clicky. And um, it was they're not a team where the guys you know, hung together you know, after the ball games. And I don't think my wife made any really close friends out there, uh, with the exception of, of Ruth Ryan. And I got to see Nolan and Ruth. <laughs> You know, on a game last night behind home home, home plate, uh, but Kathy and Ruth Ryan got to be quite close friends when uh, when we played in California. That was '74, so that was a quite a few quite a few years ago. Uh, they had two, as I remember, two uh, boys, um, Reese was one of the boys, and Reed, I think, was the other one. And, I, and both of the boys, I think, are in baseball. Um, uh, one of, exactly one of Nolan's sons pl- uh, actually played, uh, pitched pro ball. He pitched in Visalia, uh, or maybe I caught him in Visalia. I was the tops rep back in the 80s. And... Um, he pitched a ball. I don't think he got much further than that. But uh, uh, for those of you out out there listening, uh, uh, anybody who could play professional baseball, not just uh, it doesn't have to be the big leagues. There's an awful lot to be said. How few few players reach the pro level and. Um, this guy, this kid may not have been up to his dad's standards, but um, he played pro ball. So that was, that was pretty cool meeting him back in the day. You had the privilege of being really close friends, you and your wife, with both Nancy and Tom Seaver and Nolan and his wife. Um, wow. Wow. Um, and plus, you played with Frank Robinson, um, talking about Hall of Famers. You were blessed. You were absolutely blessed um, throughout your career from that standpoint. There's no question about that. Uh, the Angels uh, were an extraordinary ball club, even though we didn't we didn't win very many games. Uh, 
just having Nolan Ryan, Frank Robinson on the same team. Right, and in one locker room, Nolan Ryan, Frank Robinson, and you. That's not bad. Nolan Ryan was uh, a guy that was was such a competitor. You know, the, the things stick in your mind. I remember Seaver being the, the poet on the mound, the artist on the mound, being able to to win ball games because of his 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 capacity to prepare the game and pitch the game the way he wanted it to 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 play it. But Nolan Ryan was a gladiator. You know, he 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 wore the uniform like chainmail. He would he would go out there and pitch. Um, and you know, he's a a very uh, born again kind of guy, uh, very devout. And a lot of times, uh, at least on Sunday, they would have a, a chapel service for the the uh, the visiting clubs, uh, and even the home clubs sometimes. The chapel uh, fellowship of Christian athletes would come in and and give a chapel service for the visiting players, and Nolan would go to these and. And he would get on the mound, and not to say that he wasn't a, a kind Christian kind of guy on the mound, but boy, his demeanor would, would just change. It was it was the, the 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 ball became a weapon, and, and he he used it. He he would pitch the inside part of the plate as well as as anybody. Uh, I watch been watching the games the last couple of, of weeks, watching the, the divisional playoffs and of course the Yankees Red Sox game. And and well, one of the things that strikes me is um, they don't pitch to the inside part of the plate anymore. Very few, you know, pitchers go in to establish the inside part of the plate. Um, they pitch towards their changeup or towards the split finger. They pitch slider after slider with slow, which down and slow, slider down. Um, then they'll come up and in, you know, for for, for, a, for a ball, and then they go back out, down, down, and away. Uh, Nolan Ryan didn't do that. Uh, Nolan had a fastball that you, you would see it, you know, when it leaves his hand, and you would hear it, when it got to the catcher, uh, it was a, a quarter second delay when you were not going to be able to find that fastball. It was it was too much alive and too much on it. Too much he movement. Was, too yeah. much movement. He was spinning the ball so fast, and, and he didn't much care if he was going to pitch on the inside part of the plate. He was going to go in there as, as if he had a lot of room. And... And boy, oh boy, he was terrified. Or, uh, I, you know, I remember you yeah. with the Mets pitching pretty much the same way. You were uh, pretty much taking the inside uh, of the of the plate and not giving that up and backing guys off. Did you get that from him? I, I, well, it was the way I had to pitch. Uh, I, we've talked about this. You and I have spoken about this before. Mm-hmm. I think that the relief pitcher coming into the game has got to come in with better stuff than the pitcher that left. And for me, that was being more aggressive and going inside on the, on the plate, certainly making the fastball jump and rise and climb have life to it, late movement. You know, I always wanted my ball to to be thrown in a way that the, the catcher would, would stop it. I wasn't throwing to the catcher. I was throwing past him. I wanted the ball to have enough carry, so if he missed it, it was going to carry to the backstop. Uh, I wanted to pitch with intensity, and, and I had the Nolan – the Ryan Duran glasses on, you know, the big, heavy, thick glasses. Right, right. I wanted to use those for for my benefit, so I worked it. You know, I was out there rubbing them and, and trying to clean them off. And it was true that they were fogged up a bit. Uh, but I wanted but there's to... But there's an effect. 
you were... Yeah, yeah, I wanted every single uh, leverage point, you know, benefit I could possibly get. And one of them was, was being kind of crazy and to stand out there and you can't see well. I threw hard. Uh, Nolan Ryan stood on the mound and he kicked that leg up and the hit fire one right under your nose, 100 miles an hour. And I'm not sure I could get that kind of velocity, but if, if I went there, if I happened to go inside, that was okay. You know, it was all part of the game. It wasn't like guys would look back out at you or think that you were trying to throw at them or something like that. It wasn't. I was just trying to establish the inside part of the plate. Now, I don't know whether you see that differently watching the games today, I don't see that as much as I used to see it years ago. Well, I have a theory of why that is, and it has to do with the fraternity and the union. And I can't even put it into words, but I think uh, there isn't that intense competition between teams as there was back when I was watching ball as a kid and what, and what have you. And I think uh, with everybody being well paid, there isn't that competition for the dollar, for the spot on the roster, this, that, and the other thing. It, it, could part of it be that? that, uh, that does, it, does that ring a bell with you? Well, I, I, I certainly, I don't disagree with you. I think that the condition of the, of the sport today is that the, the players are, are somewhat interchangeable. Uh, they, the players know each other. They came up. There's a lot of trading going along. You see guys uh, a lot, you know, in, in competition. How many times did they play each other? 16, 17 times in your own division? And right. There's a lot of games. There's a lot of games between guys that you know. Uh, you see them in spring training. Um, it's it's not uncommon. They have very good friendships on the other teams. Um, I don't. I disagree a little bit that the union has 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 very much to do with that. Uh, but I think friendships do exist. Uh, I certainly had friendships. Pete Rose was was a good friend of mine. I don't know whether really? I ever told you the story about Pete, but. Pete uh, was a great competitor, as you know. Uh, yes. uh, hard scrabble, kind of a guy, um, dirty uniform, the high spikes sliding into bases, uh, you know, grinding out pitches and getting balls the other way that, that he never should have. He getting was, uh, the most out of his body as possible. He got, and he had, you, know, you know damn right well he was going to try to take an extra base when he could. He was just a, a competitor and yeah. a tough guy to play against. Uh, for what it was worth, he and I uh, became friends, and, and we would occasionally uh, get a glass of beer after a game. Um, and as, as, as conversations go, you know, I would I would say to him, Pete, I'm going to hit you in the butt tomorrow because you hit that double down the line, and and I hate you for doing that, and and you're going to pay. You know, the conversations go back and forth, and to hear the course say, well, you couldn't hurt me anyway, Lockwood. You know, so there was this this little jousting and rivalry that comes when you have a close friend and and, and you play against each other. Uh, I did get a chance to uh, one ball game uh, throw a pitch that hit him. And it was after one of these conversations had transpired uh, the evening before. And, and I got him in the ribs. And he went down to the ground and they bring, you know, I think I heard him because he was down there for a while and he was grabbing dirt and they were putting ethyl chloride on it, and, and, you know, he was, you know, trying to catch his breath and all of that. And he's taken way too long. It's, it's too theatrical for me, and, and I'm, I'm standing there waiting for him to, 
to get to finally get to first base. And he finally drags himself down to first base. And he's not looking at me. And I'm, I'm looking over to him, and he finally looks up at me. And what we had talked about the night before, of course, is that I was going to hit him if, if, I, if I saw him. And he, he looks at me, and he said, I forgot. So he obviously had, had missed the point of the conversation the evening before. <laughs> It, uh, uh, it's a it's a rivalry I think that that today uh, may to your point take away some of the the, the, the competitiveness of it. Uh, guys play for their own contract for their own well being, perhaps more than than we ever did. There was certainly something to the the rivalries between cities, uh, between you know the. the the Mets and, and the Phillies and the, the Yankees and the Red Sox, and but I'm sure they have their rivalry still in California. Uh, right, Giants and Dodgers are still strong, and um, and the A's the A's have uh, no real rivalry with the Angels for some reason. It just hasn't worked out out that way. But. Um, but they, with what well, within their interleague, they certainly do with the Giants. That's something we haven't talked about. Do you think interleague is good for the game or bad for the game? I, I think it's terrible. Uh, I've never liked it. Um, I don't understand it. Uh, in the middle of the season, you can have a very weak team come in and, and play at Fenway Park. And this was this was a scheduling event, the first of the year. Uh, you know, they're like hand, handing games away. Uh, you know, what if the what if the Orioles go into the National League and, and play someplace? They're going to lose 105 ball games. They go someplace and, and, and the National League team has to play them. Um, I just never understood. You know, we get the Phillies came in here, the Mets came in here at the end of the season. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I got to, uh, to to see some of the guys that I've known before. Uh, I just I just don't understand um, the rivalries and, and, and how this. I guess it's good for 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 baseball as a whole to to see other teams and, and have them come in. But we don't see all the teams. We only see a few. And I think it takes away from when a team's trying to grind it out at the end of the season to have the, the Mets come in and play the Red Sox. And I just don't understand what that's right. It's the unbalanced schedule that gets me. That uh, for Just for the sake of competition, everybody somewhere along the line should play the same teams and then – it, then it's fair and balanced, but um, long we're a long way from those days. I'm afraid. Um, well, I guess they can fill the ballpark. Uh, uh, you know, it gives them uh, a full capacity. Uh, uh, oh yeah, for the natural the natural rivalries, that's great. I could understand that almost. You get the Mets playing the Yankees and what have you. But uh, to the artificial, uh, yeah. what are you going to make out of Houston against uh, Kansas City, for instance? Um, just yeah. to pick two teams. I uh, pick two teams that are now in the American League. So that's um, that's uh, just goes to show you how crazy it's gotten. But. Um, can we talk about something we uh, touched on off the air, Skip, and sure. that is um, the polarization of the, this country. Um, these have been two very, very trying weeks for Americans. Um, the choosing of uh, of a Supreme Court justice that doesn't seem that it was like that when we were growing up. And it certainly doesn't seem that um, we're so far apart and we don't listen to each other. Um, I'm, it, it's very depressing to me. 
Um, can you touch on that from your standpoint? Well, I have I have a couple a couple things to say. Uh, you, you've known me now for a little while, and, and you know I'm a very positive guy, mm-hmm. and uh, I I think positively and I try to about the things around me. Uh, we have a family here. I have four daughters, and um, they have very strong opinions about politics. And uh, what the other thing I, I, I did with my daughters and my son as well is that you can have strong opinions about these things, but you need to have the facts to back them up. If you're going to argue a point, it's got to be with with reason and with facts as opposed to emotion. And so my daughters have, uh, m- more so than me, my daughters have been very uh, vociferous with, with their opinions about the political climate, uh, about the people that, that run uh, for office and get office. Uh, New Hampshire is a, a state where we elect our government officials for two years at a time, uh, we, 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 we make the governor and everybody run every two years. Uh, it's, it's a, it has been a, a very conservative state. Uh, my household is, is, is very liberal. And so we, when, when we argue about politics, these things are very hard felt positions. And, uh, having, you know, listening to uh, my daughters, you know, speak about um, Kavanaugh and, and the justice appointments and, and those kinds of things is um, very different than, than me. They, it's so personal. And, and I think so much of the co- country feels like a victim when, when their wishes and, and their uh, and their thoughts are not being expressed by their elected officials. Um, and I would be the one that would strongly advocate for that the, the people in the Senate and, and the House of Representatives vote their conscience, that they wouldn't vote straight down party lines. If something came to them and we sent them to office, I think they need to vote for that particular issue based on what they feel is best for the country, for the Constitution. Um, and they need to vote in a way... What their constituency feels is best. If they're going to represent us, shouldn't they be getting input from uh, the people that vote for them? I hope so. I really hope they do. I, I don't know that that they don't. Um, the, yeah. Well, uh, Through it all, this week has been troubling to me because Trump, over this Kavanaugh victory, and I put that in quotes, has um, has revived his his posse of thugs. (laughs) That's the the best way I can can put it. He uh, comes out in a rally uh, in Tennessee or someplace and absolutely degrades Dr. Ford, who testified uh, at the hearings against uh, Judge Kavanaugh, he just made her seem like somebody, like she was lying, basically. And that's what gets me, is that there's no sympathy for the... It's obvious obvious that um, whether he did it or not, she thinks he did it. She's troubled by it. And his demeanor makes him not a candidate for the Supreme Court. So pure and simple. Yeah. Those two things. The way he could, he never said, I'm sorry for the way she was damaged. I'm a, he, I didn't do it, but I really feel sorry for her. And... Um, if you're putting a man like that on the Supreme Court, this is um, it's, it's horrible. It's a, you know I'm a positive person too, for, for the most part. 
I'm finding very, very few things to, that are coming out of, out of this that I can hang my hat on because of the uncertainty of the upcoming prime, um, midterm elections. And um, now I'll shut up for a minute. No, the, uh, so I've got, two, I've got two things I want to say to you. Um, one is uh, the fact that it isn't alleged to be a conspiracy is troubling. It, uh, <laughs> right. The, the positioning of a possible hoax that the information was wrong, that the timing of it was set up to be a conspiracy to harm somebody, to damage their uh, uh, their reputation, uh, the timing of it was conspiratorial. Um, all of that. She talked about this years ago with her therapist before he made, even right. So this, but this all plays to the media. So the one comment I would say to you is the rise or fall of, of anyone in politics has to do with the, the vote that you cast for them. And, and we're going to get a chance to cast a vote in, in a month or so. And yep. um, you've got to keep your, your ammo dry until that happens. Uh, there's a lot of cycles between now and when the vote comes. You don't know what you know what what's coming down the pike. You don't know what the the cycle is going to be next. It'll be different. There'll be something urgent, uh, something that's damaging on either side. Something's going to happen, uh, and you'll get it. We'll get a chance to vote. The second thing I would say to you is um, thank God for baseball. Because in the middle of all this stuff, in the middle of all this rancor and, and collateral damage, and one station trying to up, up, up score, undersell, oversell, upsell the other stations, you've got baseball that comes on. And, and you can watch uh, a national pastime with, for, for teams in Texas and teams in Boston. And they play together. Uh, it's to me the greatness of baseball is it, it brings people together. There's Yankee uniforms sitting next to Red Sox uniforms. They're not fighting. They're talking to each other. They're they're, they're spilling beers on each other. And it's it's the unification of sports in this country, especially baseball, because it overlaps the seasons and we're in the playoffs right now. I think has a a very special place uh, for us, and as a as a national pastime, it, it's become, I think, more than a pastime for for many of us. But I was just thinking, in the middle of all this Kavanaugh thing, thank God I can switch the station. It's, Absolutely, there's a game play. coming out on, and after the season is over, we could go back to YouTube, we can do anything, we could play a comfortably zoned radio podcast and relive our memories of baseball when we were kids. You said it so poignantly, thank God for baseball. Well said, Skip, you you did what you had to do, you cheered me up. Good, that's what I'm here to do. All right, my friend, we'll do it again next week and... uh, Hopefully we won't need cheering up. We could cheer other people up like you Sounds did. great to me, Ralph. It's good to hear your voice. Thank you. I love talking to you. Be well, my friend. Thank you. Be well. And thank you for listening, everybody, one and all. Say hi to Kathy. Thank her again for last week's appearance. Will do, Ralph. Take care. All right. Be well. Adios, everybody. This has been a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production.